Good morning. Is this working? Okay. All right. I'm Jason Ford's dad. I'm Ethan Ford and Hatley Ford's grandfather. One of them. And I'm grateful for that connection with this church and for all the blessing that uh, my family has experienced here. I'm grateful. We're going to be looking at a passage of Scripture today that's not easy. It's a tough nut to crack. It's not for beginners. Sorry if you're a beginner. Hang in there. This is graduate school Christianity. This, this is what we need, but I have to confess that I avoided it many times because it's, it's just a tough place to bring a group of people who look as nice and act as nice as you do. It's in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 10. And if you'll look with me there, I'd like to uh, read God's Word. And I believe in honor of God's Word, it would be appropriate for us to stand for the reading of the Scripture. 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 10. Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me three times, three times, three times. I pleaded, I pleaded, I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said, no. He said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. May the Lord bless his word to our hearts. Give us faith to believe it. Holy Spirit, strength to live it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Please be seated. That's the last time I'll ask you to stand up. Maybe the last time anybody today will ask you to stand up. You're on your own now. Do what you want. This passage of Scripture is not something that you just read it or you come to it in a casual Bible study and you say, oh, yeah, that's right. It is something actually that you have to get immersed in, something you have to live through, something that has to happen to you as an individual, and I can assure you will happen to you as an individual. It's just that unexpected something. For me, it was a lightning bolt. I was just a lightning bolt of pain that hit me in the back of the head just unexpectedly. I was leading a conference of Southern Baptist missionaries in Central Europe. I had the complete responsibility for the program. I'd put it together. I'd gotten the speakers there. I'd put together the small groups. I'd organize all the questions for the groups and the large group time, the small group time. I had put it all together, and I was in charge, and I was supposed to stand up, and I was supposed to bring a message that evening. And at the lunch table, as missionaries were gathering, I was sitting there, and all of a sudden, wham, it was just like something just struck the back of my head, and I just could not even see straight for the pain that was there. I just got up quietly from the table, and I was trying to find my way back to the cabin that was across this assembly grounds, and I was so disoriented, I hardly could get there. I got to the cabin, and this is the truth. A water main had burst in that cabin, and there was about two inches of water on the floor of that cabin. My cabin, where my stuff was on the floor in two inches of water, I didn't even care. All I wanted to do was get above sea level in that bed. And I laid down the bed, pulled that pillow over me, but it wasn't enough. It was just blinding light. I couldn't get it dark enough no matter how I covered my eyes. It was just blinding. Every sound, every 
thing in my head was just screaming in pain, a pain I had never experienced before. I didn't know what was happening. And I, I, I stayed there. I just lost track of time, no, no time whatsoever. And eventually a missionary and his little boy, they came and he stuck his head in the door and said, Bob, are you all right? I said, no, I'm not all right. <laughs> I'm, I'm terrible. And, and then I said this, and to, to this day I regret it with all my heart, and I hope that little boy grew up to be a Christian. I didn't ruin his faith, but I just said, I said in that room to that missionary and his little boy, I said, if my son hurt this bad, and I had the power in my hand to take that pain off of him, I can tell you one thing, I would do it. And I can't see how God the Father would let me lay here hurting like this and not take this pain away. That's not the kind of thing that gets you called to be a pastor. (laughs) But that's where I was that day. And from there, I don't know what happened. They got me on a plane. I don't remember any details. They got me on a plane. They sent me back to Prague to my wife, Marcia, to the boys, and uh, started to see a doctor. So the first thing somebody said, you need to go see a uh, dentist because you may have impacted wisdom teeth and it'll be causing nerve pain in your head. So I went to the dentist and he poked around and he, and he stuck his hand in my mouth and, and uh, nothing happened. So I left there. He, he said, no, you don't have impacted wisdom teeth. So I, I went to uh, a, a infectious disease doctor because they thought maybe I'd picked up some kind of a a bug, and he said, well, there's some evidence of some, of some of the, but maybe that's it, maybe it's not. So then they went, sent me to a neurologist, and they, uh, this is in Prague, Czech Republic. This is t- two years after communism fell, and they put my head down on some kind of communist x-ray machine, and they <laughs> x-rayed my head, and the, the doctor came out, and he's very grimly, he says to Marcia, there is unusual amount of atrophy in his brain. And Marcia said, well, we knew that already. <laughs> That's not going to help. <laughs> let, me, let me tell you, never trust your, your head to a communist x-ray machine. It was faulty. There is no atrophy. I promise you, it's all there, <laughs> I think. So, uh, Marcia said later, if we'd sent you to an OB, he would have said you were pregnant. <laughs> Everywhere I went, it was a different diagnosis. And finally, the, it didn't let up and ended up coming back to the States and, and then just making some discoveries along the way that I want to share with you now from the Word of God. Discoveries you can't make un- until you, you live this out. Therefore, to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Dear friends and young people and everybody in this room, every believer will have to face the problem of unanswered prayer. Sometime, in some circumstance, everyone in this room, you're going to face the problem of unanswered prayer. But it does not mean and never will mean that God has forgotten you. God's not concerned about you. It simply means God's doing a work in you, a work in all of us that cannot be done in any other way. There is a problem in unanswered prayer that you begin to see right here when Paul speaks about his experience. To keep me from becoming conceited. Now, what would he have to be conceited about? Well, just about the greatest Christian who ever lived outside of Jesus Christ. Just about the greatest missionary who ever lived. Just about the greatest Bible writer who ever lived. I mean, he had some things he could be quite pleased with himself about. And he says, to keep me from becoming conceited. Every believer will have the problem of unanswered prayer because underlying it is the problem of pride. The problem of pride, and the, on the screen it'll say the problem of, of sin, but I'd like to narrow that down to the problem of pride. That, that's the heart of the issue, that we are, we are proud folks, and every, every one of us in this room has an issue whereby pride 
stands in the way between the relationship God wants to have with us and the one that we have right now. And so he's going to do something about that to keep me from becoming conceited, to keep me from becoming the kind of person who says, I, I can get through this. I can get by with this. I can get along. You, you know, it, it, it's as if the whole bunch of us at one time or another think that we can live at some point in our lives without God. I mean, we call ourselves Christian. We come to this house. We pray. We go through all the motions. But down deep inside, we still have the idea we can get to heaven on our own. We can't. And we can't get through these issues on our own. And God has to bring us all to a place sometimes where we're, we're laid out flat. And he, he begins to just pull the rug out from under us on the issue of pride. To remove pride. So it's no longer about me. It's not I. But I start focusing on him in a way I never have before. Paul says, I had this happen to me to keep me from becoming conceited. And, and that's a constant struggle that you'll have throughout life. I, I can speak for all those in this room who are 71. I don't know what happens at 72. But I can tell you for all of us who have made it to 71, it's a lifelong struggle. Where I want to be in charge. I want it to go my way. I want people to be able to say, Bob did a great job organizing that mission meeting, didn't he? Didn't he bring some great speakers? Didn't we all have a great time in the small groups and the questions that he put forth? You know, there's something in us that just thrives on that. Now, maybe you that are over 72, you can say, no, that's not our problem anymore. But for the rest of us on down, it's where we live. And God is going to do something within that issue of our pride to teach us and to bring us into a relationship with him that we've never known before. Also, and the, the problem of pride is right lined up with that is a problem of pain. The problem of pain. He speaks about a thorn in the flesh. A thorn in the flesh. A thorn in the flesh was given to me. Let me ask you a question. Who gave the thorn in the flesh to Paul? Who gave it to him? Would, would, let me ask you, would the devil give a thorn in the flesh to keep you from becoming conceited? Now, the, the devil wants you to be one conceited joker, thinking more of yourself than anybody else. That's what the devil wants. It's not the devil. It is the fact that God allowed Pass through his hands this very painful experience in the life of Paul because he's going to accomplish something through the thorn that he can't accomplish any other way. God uses thorns. Man, it hurts. It is painful. The problem is pain. Have you ever had, I'm not talking about a splinter, I'm talking about a two by four. Go up under your fingernail and go down under your fingernail all the way down to the white part so that the end of that stick of wood is right down and you can't even see the end because it's gone under where the skin is. And you have that in your thumb. Now your rest of you is okay. Your head's okay. Your throat's okay, you're breathing okay, your legs are okay, but your thumb, your thumb is killing you. It's just a little thumb. You want to go in the house and perform open thumb surgery with a butter knife to scrape that thing out of there, get that thing out of there, because all you're thinking about is that stick of wood in your thumb. And that's what Paul's talking about because he had been, rocks had been thrown at him. He'd been left for dead. He'd been sunk in a ship and spent day and night in the water. He had been run out of town. He'd been thrown in prison. And, he, and now he's just bothered by this, a thorn. Because a thorn just takes the whole the whole of your life. A thorn allowed by God 
Satan's using it to torment. The word torment is literally knuckles. Where Satan's a knuckling, just every once in a while. It's, it's sporadic, you know, just, just give him a knock. I have studied for three weeks now the issue of the thorn. I have read commentaries. I have listened to sermons. I have spent time considering this. And I, I, I want to tell you what the thorn, what I've learned about the thorn. What was Paul's thorn? What was it? And Jason, I'm going to tell you first. So you'll know I can pass it on to you after all my study. Here's the answer, Jason. I don't know. And neither will you, smarty pants. <laughs> you'll never know. We don't know. And that's good. Because if it's one thing, if it was like bad eyesight, we'd say, well, I don't have bad eyesight. This doesn't apply to me. Or if it was about uh, a wounded spirit because people were against him there in Corinth, would say, well, I don't have that problem because everybody likes me down at the church. But the deal is, he left it, the Holy Spirit left it just like that because every one of us either has a thorn, has had a thorn, or we'll, we'll, we will have a thorn, something that hurts so bad. So bad. I just talked to Mama this morning. She, she can't be dead. Oh. It hurts. After this last service, a nice looking young man, about 70, came down and he stopped me in the aisle. And he said, Do you remember me? He said, I sat behind you at First Baptist Church, Dallas, about 20 years ago. And he said, I just want to thank you for the message because I know the pain of that hurt you were talking about. My wife, Trisha, has passed away, and he said, I, I needed to hear this message. See, there's pain in every pew. Or something along the way is going to uh, touch your life. Uh, uh, a kid, the boy you love, your kid, who... who disappears and turns his back on the faith and, you, and you're left with a thorn. A marriage that you endure, but every day is just thorns. There was one, though, who on a certain day and a certain place, he was crowned with thorns. And he bore on the cross all our pain, all our grief, and all our sorrows. There is one who, in whatever pain you are in, you can put your head down and say, Lord, it was this is nothing compared to what you did for me to make a way for me to get into heaven. In the sight of the cross, our pain becomes diminished. But it's a problem. And, and the real problem, too, is when it goes on and on and on, and it just won't stop. It's a problem of time. One, one thing good about pain, it makes you pray. It, it drives you to prayer. There are certain things that happen in your life that drive you to prayer. When a son is out in Southeast Asia handing out Bibles to communists, you pray. And your other son is learning how to fly a helicopter, you pray. There are things that drive you to pray, and pain is one of them. Having the thorn, that's, that's why we have them. But the, the problem is, when you pray and pray and pray, Lord, take it away, take it away. And, and you, I'm going to leave it with you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And then you, you may even stand up and give a testimony. Wednesday night, I, I prayed and I put it in God's hands and I, I'm trusting him. But six months later, that same deal, that same pain is there. And you pray and you pray and you pray and you're not brave anymore to confess it before the prayer meeting. You just leave it real quiet, but you're hurting, but you're praying. But then weeks and months pass and you find yourself again in that same place of, in the ministry of the thorn and you're kneeling and you're praying and you're just ready to give up because nothing seems to be happening. 
He prayed three times. I prayed three times, Lord, take it away, take it away, take it away. Who else prayed three times? In a garden. Who prayed? Lord, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Lord, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Lord, let this cup pass from me, but nevertheless, not my will, but thine. Aren't you grateful that sometimes prayers aren't answered? Can you imagine if God said, okay, son, I can see this is too much to ask of anyone born of a woman, born of the flesh. I can't ask it of you. You're freed from the, the dread of the cross. Thank God for unanswered prayer. And in all our lives, when we look back on it, no matter how bad the thorn, there is in the mind and heart and will of God a reason He brought you that way. Be thankful for unanswered prayer. Do any of you know that great American theologian and poet, Garth Brooks? You familiar with him? Uh, he wrote these very wise lines for us to consider. Sometimes I thank God for unanswered prayer. Remember when you're talking to the man upstairs that just because he doesn't answer doesn't mean he don't care. Some of God's greatest gifts are unanswered prayer. And some of you country folk will know the rest of that song and the application to it. But the truth is, thank God, he doesn't answer every prayer. Because we, we've got a problem. We've got a problem. It's that pride problem. It's a sin problem. It's a pain problem. It's a time problem. And only God can figure all that out. And when we try to do it, James says, you have not because you ask not. And when you ask, you ask amiss to spend it on yourself. So here's the bottom line. God is more interested in your holiness than he is with your health. God is more interested in your holiness than he is with your wealth. He's more interested in your purity than he is with your possessions. He's more interested in righteousness than in riches. He's more interested in conforming you and me into the image of Christ than making us comfortable in this world. And I guarantee you most Baptist prayers are about our health, our finances, our comfort. But God is bigger than all of that. This God is bringing us to heaven to live with Him forever. And He's getting us ready. Every believer needs to trust God's purpose. This is what the scripture says. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I'll boast more gladly about my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Every believer needs to trust in God's purpose. Despite unanswered prayer, we can trust him even when he says no. Even when he says no to me, my grace is sufficient. Literally, here's what the Greek is. Sufficient for you is the grace of me. Sufficient for you is the grace of me. The grace of me. We have some Sunday school answers for grace when I ask you, what is grace? And somebody raise their hand and say, God's unmerited favor. It's a very good Sunday school answer. And somebody else says, it's uh, God's riches at Christ's expense. I'm glad you learned that. That's a good one. But you really don't ever know much about grace until you're disgraced, <laughs> until you're brought low. And he puts his hand on you and he speaks to you through his word. 
and, and it comes off the page at you. Sufficient for you is the grace of me, of me, of God. Of God moving into the situation. I'm hopeless. You pulled the rug out from me. I'm hurting. I, I just want to throw in the towel and then and God moves in. The grace of me, me. You never know the intimacy of the me of grace until you get to that place uh, of deepest need, thorn place. We lived on the Atlantic Ocean, St. Augustine, Florida, right on the intercoastal canal on one side, Atlantic Ocean on the other, and we had a boat. My brother and I had a boat. It was a rotten old boat, a rowboat. That's all we could do is row it. One Memorial Day weekend, my dad on the Monday morning came into the room, and we didn't get Monday off for Memorial Day. Had to go to school. And we thought he was getting us up to go to school, and he says, boys, get up, get up, get up. We're going fishing. Daddy's taking us out of school to go fishing. That was just the most wonderful moment of my life to this day, except salvation and marriage and kids. But you cannot know the joy of a 10-year-old saying, you don't have to go to school, we're going fishing. So we went down to the little beach where we kept a boat and put in a picnic lunch. And, and my dad rowed and my brother and I bailed. And we got that old rowboat across the inlet there in St. Augustine to a sandbar across the way. And we set up fishing camp. And oh, it was a great day. <laughs> you know what happens in days in Florida? In the spring, as you look out toward the west, what begins to happen is this huge black curtain rises up. And in it are bolts of lightning. First, they're distant, and you barely hear the thunder, and then it gets closer and closer and closer. And by the time we looked up and gathered our wits about us, there was no way we were going to make it back to the other side to get home before that storm broke. So our daddy, he went looking in the bottom of the old rowboat, and he found an old piece of tarp, a stinking piece of canvas. Who knows where it had been or what it had done. But he took that canvas tarp, and he said, Bobby, you sit over here. Kenny, you sit on this side. And, and my daddy took that tarp, and he pulled it around us, and we sat there in the sand, and lightning started flashing. I mean, boom, boom, thunder rolling. And we, but I was under my daddy's arms. And it was the safest place I'd ever been in my life. I was too stupid to realize that that lightning could hit the three of us. I was sure my dad could ward off anything that might happen and that we were safe as long as he held on to us. And he held us and the thunder boomed and we were shouting and swearing, bring it on, what a storm. And we were just loving it. Under the covering of my dad my father, which is nothing in comparison to the covering of my heavenly father, the covering of our heavenly father in every storm. With every thorn, there is grace sufficient. Sufficient for you is the grace of me, my God, holding, sustaining, carrying, protecting, watching, looking, guiding my father. Over in chapter 8 of this same book, I think it's verse 9, or it could be chapter 9, verse 8. But it says, it says, all grace, he is able to abundantly supply all grace, in every situation, at all times, in all circumstances, for every good work. Uh, Paul has already established in 2 Corinthians, this grace is amazing grace. It covers everything, covers everybody in this room. You've got a thorn, you have a pain unspoken in this room, you have something very real. Well, there is a covering over the people of God. It's His grace. 
And it is sufficient. It is going to get us through. It's going to get us all the way to heaven. Amazing grace. You're going to go to the Thanksgiving table just in a few days, some of you. And you're going to sit there at the table, some of you. Some of you be working in the kitchen. Some of you be on the road. But some of you will sit down at a table. And you'll say to the others at the table, let's bow our heads. Let's bow our heads and give thanks for the grace of God. That we can be together. You know, it, grace changes everything. It'll change a family at a dinner table on a Thanksgiving day if you just speak grace into the life of your family. We need to trust the sufficiency of his grace. We need to trust him despite our weakness. Really, because of our weakness, we need to trust him. He trusted you with that trouble. He trusted you with that thorn. And we can trust him even when he says no. I don't guess there was ever a weaker moment. Was there? When uh, Jesus was nailed to the cross. We can trust him in that weakness. When Jesus was nailed to the cross. It looked like God had been defeated. It looked like that was the end of the story. And the devil had won. But at that weakest moment. God did the most amazing thing. He died in our place. He took our sins away. Away. As far as the east is from the west, he took them away. He buried them in the deepest part of the sea. The greatest power ever expressed was in the cross when he shouted out, it is finished, and he did with our sins what only he could do. He changed world history in the moment that looked the weakest and in our lives it is that point sometimes when we are at our lowest when at our weakest that God is doing the greatest thing that he could not do in any other way but laying us low so he could bring us up high like he did in the life of his son at that cross and then from an empty tomb we can trust him despite our weakness. We can trust his sustaining power. His power is working. He hasn't stopped. We can trust his sustaining power, the power of God. Listen, do you believe this? In all things, God is working for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Do you believe that? In all things, God is working for good. For those who he's called, for those who've loved him and are called according to his purpose, God is working. God is working. You can't see it. You don't understand it. I don't know how a thorn can be God's way of working in my life, but I'm going to say thy will be done. God, you accomplish your purpose in me. Make me more like Jesus. Make me more like him. Let's look at this, this third aspect of unanswered prayer. Every believer can experience power despite unanswered prayer. And Paul, Paul speaks about power back there in the previous verse. Gladly I boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. And then he says, and that is why for Christ's sake I delight in weaknesses and insults and hardships, persecutions, difficulties. I delight, he says, weaknesses, that's, that's uh, physical issues. Insults, that's relational issues. Hardships, that's financial issues. Persecution, that's spiritual issues. Difficulties, that covers everything else, if you can think of anything else. He says, I delight in it. I experience God's power because his power can change my attitude. Does anybody have an attitude where you say, hip, hip, hooray, insults? Oh, I'm so glad. Difficulties. Wonder of wonders. I've got some persecution going. Uh-uh. There has to be an attitudinal change that he can say, I glory in it. Uh, I glory in it. I'm content in it, literally. I'm content with this situation I'm in. There's an attitude change, and it happens. It's right there in the Scripture, for the sake of Christ. Why, why can my attitude change? Because I know Jesus is doing something for the sake of his glory. For the sake of Jesus being seen in me, 
I, I'm content with this happening because I know I'm just a clay jar, but I know I've got a treasure within, and I want people to see the treasure within my heart. I want to see you see Jesus in me. I'm content that this is happening because I'm going to live it in an unexpected way. Counterintuitively, I'm going to live this out for Jesus. There's an attitudinal change in the midst of it. Have you ever known somebody with cancer? And at first it's devastating, but you just watch them in the process. They're a believer, and they're walking with Jesus through this thing, and, there's an added, and you walk away from them saying, they cheered me up. I went in there to cheer them up, but I, I got cheered up in that hospital room just listening to their faith. There's an attitudinal change. There, there's a change that takes place. There's a transformation that takes place in and the way we view circumstances. You see all of these things that are happening, the insults, the hardships, the weaknesses, all of that. I started thinking about that. That's like a training ground. That's, that's like where you get, you get some really heavy-duty training for heaven. And for living the Christian life at a level nobody, people rarely get to in that kind of hard knocks school of Christianity. And it changes the way you view it. This is not just happening randomly. Randomly, this is not chance. This is God has brought me into this because he's doing something in me that he, he, he can't do any other way. And the circumstance becomes different. I, I was reading this week, and made me think about the SEALs training. Training for Navy SEALs. Anybody in here a Navy SEAL? Anybody a Navy SEAL? Don't be ashamed. Anybody here want to be a Navy SEAL? <laughs> After I read about the training, I do not want to be a SEAL, and I don't want my grandboys to do this. It is dangerous. One of the things they, they do is called sugar cookie. Sugar cookie is when they take them all down to the beach pre-dawn. Pacific water is freezing. And they go wade into the water, boots, long trousers, equipment, and they walk into the water, and they stand neck deep in the surf. The whole bunch of them. Just standing together in that freezing surf. And what the deal is, they're waiting for five of them to quit. And then the others can get out when five quit. To quit, you get out of the water, you go over, and you ring a bell. When you ring the bell... You're out of the SEAL training program. One group of guys went into the water. They're standing together. They're waiting for five of their brothers to quit, and there's no quitters. They keep standing and standing, and, and, and then one of, them, one of them breaks out in song. Not a good song, not well sung. Uh, a stupid little song like Row, Row, Row Your Boat. He starts singing at the top of his lungs out of tune. Then a buddy next to him joins in. They start singing Row, Row, Row Your Boat. Three or four more are singing Row, Row, Row Your Boat. And finally, the whole bunch of these men are laughing their heads off, singing Row, Row, Row Your Boat. They're in it together, and not a one of them's going to ring the bell. They stand there till the sun comes up and the sun goes down. But they're not going to quit. Nobody's going to ring the bell. They're in it together. That's why I love church. That's why I love coming to church. Because I can go sometimes and I can be low and I can have a thorn and I can sit down in one of these seats at my church over in Rogers, Arkansas. And they start to sing. And all of a sudden I'm not thinking about my thorn anymore. I'm not thinking about my circumstances. I'm thinking about how great is our God. I, I, I would just love it if somebody would stand up in a service like this and just start singing about the wonderful grace of God. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all my sin. Oh, he transforms those circumstances. Sometimes it's just a song. It reminds us who we are, what we have in Christ. 
and what he can do with folks like us. Transforms my weakness into his strength. Here's the rest of the story. Flew me back to the United States. I'm hurting. I'm crippled up in that little airplane seat, just folded up like a Swiss Army knife, just folded on myself. The stewardess came and said, are you okay? And I said, I'm really hurting. And she says, wait a minute. And she came back and she said, come with me. And they took me up and put me in first class. And there was nobody in, in first class. And they made a, spread that chair out, made a bed out of it. And Marsha, and I, I don't think the boys were with us, but Marsha uh, was back there. And she said, after they brought me through, a lady back toward the first class door stood up and she said, any of you people of prayer? She said, the man they just took is a missionary and he needs prayer. I mean, this is on a, a Delta airplane. A woman stands up and asks for prayer from the passengers for me. When we got to Dallas, I, I went to uh, the hospital and uh, one of the things they wanted to do, they said my muscles were so tight they really wanted me to get some massage therapy and get loosened up at this neck and back and before they did some tests and so I went to get a massage and she was a Nigerian lady and she had her hands on my shoulders and she was saying and who are you where are you from and I said I don't know if that was her accent but that's what I remember <laughs> <laughs> she's I said, I, I'm a missionary. We were in Europe, but I had to come home because of some things going on. And she said, and she talked to me. And she said, what kind of missionary are you? And I said, Southern Baptist missionary. She slapped me on the back. She said, my mother and I were saved by Southern Baptist missionaries who came to Nigeria and shared the gospel with us. And she took hold of my shoulders and she started praying. And she was gripping my shoulders and she prayed over me. Oh, Lord, God, have mercy on this man. Oh, Lord, raise this man up. Free him from his pain. Send him back to the mission field. So she's praying for me like that. Several days later, they take me up to a Baylor hospital to do a spinal tap. And I'm in the bed suffering. <laughs> and in the bed next to me is an African-American man. And that afternoon, his whole family comes in. All kinds of aunts and grandmothers and women, a whole row of them all around. And they pull the curtain. They say, what's wrong with you? And I said, I said, oh, I just had a spinal tap. And they said, uh, you believe in prayer? I said, yes, ma'am. I'm, I'm a missionary. A missionary laying in that bed. That's not right. Said, Come on over here, ladies. Let's pray. So she brings the group and, they, and she lays hands on me. And she expels the devil from the room. I've never seen anything like it. I've never seen anything like it. And l listen, I'm not that kind of charismatic wing of the Baptist church. But I want to tell you, I would do it again if they would just chase the devil out of the room. And she opened the door and said, devil, get out of here. And you have no place here. And she slammed the door on the devil. And I want to tell you, I had the most peaceful evening I've had in a long time when she ran the devil out of that hospital room. What I, I'm telling you is there's, there's, there's evidence of his grace. There's drops of mercy all along the way. Still hurting, drops of mercy, evidence of grace. God's good hand, never take it off. He's always there. He's always touching. He's always reaching. He's always taken hold. Oh, what a wonderful God. Therefore, listen, here's the therefore. Come boldly to the throne of grace. Let us come boldly to the throne of grace. For we have a great high priest who is not untouched by our thorns. He bore them. He was wounded for our transgressions. Therefore, come boldly to the throne of grace and find help. Find the grace that helps in time of need. You may not be there this morning. The fact is, after the first service, many people came to me and said, I sat here with my thorn and I'm trusting in the grace of God. 
but for many in this room, come now to the throne of grace. And, and right before him this morning, say, Lord, your will be done. I prayed and I prayed and I prayed and you haven't changed our home situation. You haven't healed my grief. You haven't brought my boy home. But I'm just laying my life down before you because you're all I have. Sufficient for you, he says, is the grace of me. Come and spend a, just a moment with him. Just a, a moment that says with all your being, with your body, with your life, I'm yours. I'm not going to ring the bell. I'm not going to quit. It hurts, but I'm not going to ring the bell. I'm going to stand with the people of God. Amen? Amen. Amen.